Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. This is the after show for James Tours, Episode 6, The Building Blocks of Building Blocks. Uh, since some of, um, some of you are about to join, let me uh, try to get a few administrative things going here. Um, let me... So, yeah, I just cut down an echo. Oh, there are four people here already. So greetings. I'm going to uh, post a, um, a link to the stream for those that I know. I've, I've had to have a policy of, uh, trying to, of, of screening people who join the show. There have been some bad behaviors here. So, people are welcome to join. We're well behaved. If I don't know who you are, uh, just try to describe who you are in the chat and um, um, feel free to join. I only have six slots. Uh, some people have YouTube, uh, I'm sorry, StreamYard accounts that can have six people. So, there are I've been trying to describe some of the basics of how this works. I see someone new here, FS, hello, greetings. Thank you for joining. I'd like to, let me see if I could find, there is a great book that, for, for those who really wanna study this, uh, particularly those, uh, this would be good for people who are chemistry students uh, and even if you're not, this is still a good book. There is the book, let's see if I could find it, Stairway to Life. And let me see if I can adjust the view here. There's the book, Stairway to Life. Andrew Kaufman is here. Jeremy Martin, greetings. Let me see, I see if anyone's trying to join the after show yet on StreamYard. So far, okay, so far I may have to do this uh, solo. So I'm gonna see if I can get one of my PowerPoint slides here. If I could show, I, there, there's some ideas here that are really basic. Uh, here, I have, I have a graphic here I'd like to share. Dr. Tour is not the only chemist that has noticed all these problems. There have been numbers of them, and let me show you one of these here. Let me do a screen share. This book, The Stairway to Life, An Origin of Life Reality Check by Change Loritan and Rob Stadler. Some of you are familiar with this, but uh, this is just for the, the new viewers here. And uh, what was great about this book is it, it came out before Dr. Tour has started his series on abiogenesis. It parallels many of the um, things, but in much more greater detail. And let me tell you a little bit about the authors. Uh, the lead author is Change Laura Tan. She is a, she's an Ivy League, um, she was an Ivy League PhD and also postdoc at Harvard Medical School. She's now an associate professor of biological sciences in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Missouri. Now a little bit of background about that. She uh, is under a lot of persecution because uh, she's teaching at a mainstream secular university. So um, uh, just, just uh, bear that in mind. Uh, she has risked a lot to be able to uh, write this book and speak her conscience. In the meantime, I'm going to pin the link to the after show. So well-behaved members or um, participants are welcome to join. So let me see. Let me put this one down here. It's hard managing all the windows. That's one reason that it's hard to be running a... Uh, be hosting a show. It's nicer when someone else is the host. 
her co-author is also brilliant. He uh, got his PhD at Harvard and MIT. He has over 140 US patents. Uh, there are millions of people that uh, have his medical devices implanted in them, life-saving stuff. And he's been critical of um, evolutionary biology and also the theory of abiogenesis. So these are two brilliant people. Now, what did Professor Dave do? Rob Stadler, uh, again, one thing I'll point out, they wrote this book, Change Laura Tan, Rob Stadler's co-author, is a physical organic chemist. She taught it. She's a real professor, unlike a, a quote unquote Professor Dave. She's a real professor. She understands nucleotides. She understands RNA. She understands DNA. She teaches it in her class. And Rob Stadler went to Dave's channel and pointed out his errors. Dave banned him. That's the kind of behavior we get from quote unquote Professor Dave. Uh, Rob Stadler had, um, uh, it was just setting him straight and Professor Dave would have nothing to do with it. That's not the behavior appropriate. Uh, if you're talking purely science and Rob is a very, um, a very even tempered person and he just tells the facts and he was just setting Professor Dave on the facts and Dave would have nothing to do with it. That's the sort of guy we're dealing with in Professor Dave. And uh, we can cover a little bit of some of the problems and it's becoming apparent why this is such a, um, what we would think is trivial is actually not so trivial. It may be trivial if there's an intelligence. For some things, it may be trivial. For, for other things, not so trivial to make the chemicals we find in life. Now, people will say, there, oh, there's there probably so many ways to make life. The, the problem is, let's just grant that for the sake of argument. The problem is the life that uh, we find on our planet is made of chemicals that are, that as a matter of principle, are very unlikely to emerge, very likely to emerge, very unlikely to emerge from a prebiotic earth. So, oh, before I forget, if you don't wanna purchase the book, there's an excellent lecture where Rob Stadler gives it, gives a lecture on the stairway to life. You can Google it. It was also on Standing for Truth's channel. And Logical Probable, uh, the Rush Limbaugh of creationism, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for visiting. And I have a link to the channel if you'd like to join in our beatdown and annihilation of Professor Dave. I was just uh, pointing out how Professor Dave, when confronted with um, the facts that Rob Stadler was stating, instead of backing down, he banned Rob Stadler. So th that's the guy we're dealing with. And uh, Dr. Tour was very gracious to say, you know, I, you know, he was saying very nice, he, as, as nice as he could, uh, things about Professor Dave. Dave has not responded in kind. He explicitly called Dr. Tour a liar, which is ironic given that Professor Dave is a fake professor calling a real professor like Professor Tour a liar. That's the irony. Anyway, so uh, I would encourage people that uh, if they don't buy the book, the video is excellent. I'll cover some of the principles of I'll cover some of the principles of why uh, some of the things Dr. Tour talked about. I may dumb a few things down, and there there may be a few things I actually go into more detail. But let me show the, the basic issue, and I'm going to do it by just showing a, a picture. When I taught intelligent design in extracurricular activities at uh, universities like James Madison University, um, I gave an exercise, very simple exercise. <clears throat> I said, okay, just take some man-made objects, and I'll show you some of these man-made objects here. Let me share my screen. I'll show some man-made objects. I 
I give the students man-made objects like this. <clears throat> so granted, these these are we could call them building blocks. I said, okay, that, that's a given. That's just a given. But in addition to these building blocks, can you arrange them in a way that an outside observer would look at the way that you arrange these building blocks and say, hey, that arrangement is definitely the product of intelligent design. And the reason this is important, um, the reason this is important is that this can be applied to the molecular level and it, it actually parallels the problem of relay synthesis that Dr. Tour was uh, alluding to. And I'm appreciating why he said relay synthesis is cheating. Relay synthesis is cheating. So one could examine these dice, for example, and see that they're ordinary fair dice, but there's something unusual in the way that they're laid out. Can you see it? They're all showing the six. They're all showing six, the six pointed up, face up, six face up. There are other subtle things here. These dominoes here are all in a row. Not to mention, if you, uh, this is not a very, uh, it's very hard to get a domino to lie on its uh, edge like that. I, I mean, obviously it can be done, but they're also in a row and they're, they're close together. Uh, that's an indication that this configuration is designed and the same could be said about the way these are stacked. Now, there are various ways to argue why this is improbable as a matter of principle. And uh, we can argue that intuitively, but there are uh, uh, doing it formally is actually a little bit more challenging than one might think. So I'm going to go back to this. And you've seen me, uh, some of you have seen me show this diagram before. These are coins, these are quarters, and they're configured with all, all heads. All the coins, these are fair coins, and they're, uh, they're showing all heads. From a mathematical standpoint and also from physics, the reason this is unusual is um, the coins, they have something what they call uh, inertia tensors that will um, indicate it's unstable. So, so you could flip them. There's no preferred, there's generally um, no preferred uh, preference for being heads or tails. If, if there is, it's going to be very, very slight and not sufficient to explain why all of these are heads. So let's just assume for the sake of argument, there is even just a slight bias. It still won't be enough to explain uh, from the sake of, um, random conditions like random flipping of the coins why they would be all uh, why they would be all heads not to mention you'll notice that they're all oriented in um, with the heads pointed up now this is very similar to the problems of homochirality especially for nucleotides especially for nucleotides more so than for than for amino acids And the, the problem, the reason that this is highly unusual as a matter of principle is what we call the law, of, it's a violation of the law of large numbers. That's just the formal term for why this, uh, th this would be astonishing and would actually require intelligence to, to give that configuration. Someone has to go there and pick it out. Uh, natural processes, natural randomizing process, processes will not um, favor either the tails or the heads. Even though you can distinguish the state of tails or heads, the physics doesn't have a preference. And this, this happens at the molecular level too. And so this whole thing of purified chemicals, what they're doing is when they have, they need homochiral chemicals, uh, the scientist has to go and pick, um, uh, find a way to be able to pick out something that's like, so to speak, all heads or all tails. The easiest way to do it is to cheat, is as what Dr. Tour mentioned, go and buy the chemicals which were actually extracted from living organisms, because otherwise it's going to be really hard to synthesize this in the lab, very hard to synthesize it. Dr. Tour pointed out the problem with amino acids and how 
Professor Dave totally misrepresented a paper that actually cheated without actually mentioning that it cheated uh, because they used a starting seed of um, a strongly in excess L amino acid. And uh, that doesn't happen in nature. That, that doesn't happen uh, naturally in nature. And then, but it's really worse. It's far worse for the nucleotides, the, the building blocks of amino, uh, I'm sorry, the building blocks of DNA and RNA. And so there's a lot of cheating going on and misreporting and hype in the papers. And it's not, it's not honest. I'm glad he called out some researchers and saying, that's just telling lies. And that's, that's really what it is. So how does this relate to the problem of life? The problem of life is not building a replicator. Some people will try to redefine the problem of building life uh, to be something else than the problem that really needs to be solved. The problem that needs to be solved is why do we have the chemicals that we have in life? These chemicals should not be, um, they should not arise from a prebiotic soup. It's just that simple. So, so it's not a matter of saying specifically life. It's really more specifically the kind of chemicals that shouldn't arise from a prebiotic soup. And one thing I wanted to say I wanted to have a picture uh, of this and I may develop it over the next year. I'm hoping to work with Dr. Carter, who is a professor of organic chemistry, professor of biochemistry. He's a professional biochemist. And um, I'd like to refine some of the diagrams, but Dr. Um, um, Dr. Carter and I have talked about this um, a little bit. And, and, and there's some, um, Maybe I'm going to try to just illustrate the probability, improbability here. It's, it's just, if you look at this card, this house of cards, it's just not like what you would expect. It's just not what you would expect. It's the coordination. Do you see the coordination there? Now, uh, you can build other kinds of houses of cards. But then you could see that this, you would not be astonished to see an arrangement of cards like this. So even though in a sense, this is improbable in as much as you could probably take a random a shuffle of cards and you'll never be able to duplicate it exactly, you will not be astonished. But the problem is building a house of cards, building uh, a set of cards together to make houses of cards. So, By the way, I ran this, <laughs> I ran this uh, problem by someone who goes by the handle snake was right. And I said, don't you think that's unusual? He said, yeah, I'll kind of grant that. I'm just like, come on, dude. <sighs> anyway. I'm going to show the chirality. Uh, there's a chirality problem here. So if we had these Scrabble letters, if you just, took the Scrabble letters and just dumped them on, on the uh, ground, you'd, you'd get kind of a randomized pie like that. That's just normal physics. Normal physics will not give you a nice arrangement of um, Scrabble letters that are nice rows and columns. Now, this is analogous to the problem of building a DNA. In DNA, everything has to, I don't know if you can kind of see this. Do you see the, the, the regular phosphate group here? appearing regularly. And then you can also see this is the deoxyribose here. So I'm gonna just highlight it, the deoxyribose appearing in regular intervals and the phosphate group appearing in re regular intervals. The thing that can be variable are the bases. So this is adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. This arrangement, th this, pol this polymer makes, makes DNA readable. Even if it weren't, even if um, the goal weren't to make it readable, it's still an unusual arrangement. Just by way of analogy, uh, again, if you saw the Scrabble letters and they, didn't, they, they don't even need to be in any particular sequence here, but just getting them aligned in rows and columns would really stand out. And 
in par uh, by way of analogy, it's highly improbable you could get this arrangement. Now, what happens in this thing where uh, James Tour is saying that there is uh, relay synthesis and it's cheating is that um, one, you would get different, you would you'd get different sugars appearing here and that wouldn't be good for reading it. But even if it were or were not good, it's still unusual. It's just like having it all heads. But the, the problem gets worse in many ways because of the connections here. And Dr. Tan pointed out the problems in the connections. So nucleotide, let me see if I have a picture of a nucleotide. Do I have a picture of a nucleotide? No. Oh, here it is. A nucleotide is composed of this deoxyribose sugar and a phosphate group and a base. And the base can be AGTC for DNA. And what Dr. Tan pointed out is you could connect those three parts. So there are three parts. You have the phosphate group, the sugar, and the, and the nucleobase. What Dr. Tan pointed out is that there's no inherent way in solution or whatever prebiotic soup you have that they have to connect um, the same way each time. Uh, as Dr. Tour is pointing out, uh, you could have the connections above or below, and that's a, that's a change here where it's below. It's not quite as evident. But there's some things that are really, um, really obvious here. Like the normal connection here for, let me see if I could see this. The normal con connection for the sugar to the base would be with a one prime location. In this case here, it could connect to the three prime location. It takes a lot of machinery to be able to, to do this when we're synthesizing it from scratch. And Professor Dave had the gall to say, oh, it's easy, it's so easy we can build machines for it. I wanted to say, that's kind of dopey because the reason you build machines is it's not easy to synthesize because if it were easy to synthesize as in easy enough to happen on a prebiotic earth, you wouldn't have to build a machine. You wouldn't have to build a machine. I, I mean, that's just, I mean, to me, that's just really kind of self delusional in my opinion. But um, anyway, uh, I'm sorry, this is turning into a monologue. I was hoping someone would join and um, keep me, uh, keep the show going. Otherwise this, uh, I'm probably gonna have to shut the stream down if someone doesn't join soon. Uh, but in any case, um, I'm hoping perhaps to refine the presentation I made. I kind of rambled on in a few spots. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna monitor the uh, chat here if there are any questions. Let's see. Let's see if I see anything here. Uh, let me highlight a comment. Can I do that here? I'm going to highlight some comments. It's really hard to host a show without other people. So, um, one of my regular co-hosts is, uh, Emery Moyna and Emery is finishing up some homework. He said, if I'm, if I'm still talking after this uh, in, in 45 minutes, uh, he, he may join. Emery is a graduate student uh, in biology. So uh, it's always great having him on. So let me see. There is a comment by logical, probable, plausible. There it is. I want to show that comment. Dave banning Rob Stadler is why he wanted to do a response video on standing for truth on the truth channel. So I'm presuming that's why Rob Stadler wanted to do a response video on the standing for truth channel. Yeah, that was, that was just totally ridiculous. <laughs> All right. So what else shall I talk about? I can talk about my work. Um, also in relation to this. So 
probably trying to make some of James Tour's work and also the work of Change Tan and um, Rob Stadler and others more accessible is kind of one of the goals of um, my channel here. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to educate um, as many people as possible with videos on chemistry and uh, other topics. My my specialty is biophysics and structure protein structural biology. Uh, my background was actually in aerospace and defense. Uh, in, was uh, being a scientist in the aerospace scientist and engineer in the aerospace and defense industry, and then I ended up doing biology, which has been great, and also highlighting God's work. Now I remember one thing I wanted to say is that uh, God has left surprises for us in biology. If a synthetic chemist like uh, Eshin Moser, I can't pronounce his name, was trying to make pentose, and it took him like 90 pages to even get just a little, just a little bit in the right direction. He didn't even, he, he wasn't even able to synthesize what he really wanted to synthesize. That's telling me that, that God left some surprises there, that the best chemists and scientists on the planet cannot even do a measly sugar that's essential for DNA. That's telling me there is a mind that's far beyond anything that we can understand and also greater capability. And that's just, that's just a very simple sugar. And, and just, just to, to show again, it's, it's not, I mean, it's deceptively, it's a deceptively simple looking sugar. Uh, uh, let me, let me show it again here. It's a deceptively simple looking sugar. Just trying to get all the buttons clicked. That sugar that Eschen Moser was trying to put together is this one. This one. It's not, I mean, it's, it's, it looks deceptively simple but it's brutal to make. And then it, to compound matters, when they're trying to synthesize it, you end up with all this other stuff that you don't want. And how do you sort it out? Uh, one would think f filtering stuff is really easy, but God chose a molecule that is not easy, that is not, it, it's almost like God deliberately chose, constructed these chemicals to, to tell you, hey, I know that there's going to be the 21st century at some time in human history. You guys will be building atomic bombs and doing genetic engineering. But by the way, I'm going to leave you a molecule here and it may look deceptively easy to make, but you're not going to be able to make it so easily and you're not going to be able to isolate it and filter it. And then you're not going to be able to connect it to other things um, to make even a simple nucleobase, uh, nucleo, nucleotide, I'm sorry, nucleotide. So, he couldn't even, uh, 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 the synthetic chemist couldn't even make this, much less get it to connect to this and this. And so why is it so hard to think there's the great synthetic chemist in the sky who has far more capabilities and knowledge and wisdom and power than we have? So there's a testimony there. Because if it were that easy, it would it would happen. It would happen. You wouldn't need machines. And they, Professor Dave's totally wrong to be saying that, oh, it's so easy, therefore we can make machines. That's ridiculous. The reason you make machines is it's not that easy. Making a machine is not easy. It's collectively difficult. It requires the intelligence of quite a number of people to be making the materials, the raw materials, the instruments, etc. And that's just delusional to say, oh, it's we have machines to make it, therefore it's easy. That's delusional. So I'm going to um, monitor. Let's see. There's a question here. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try to, you can type your questions. I apologize if I miss some. Um, 
Okay. Andrew Kaufman says, I just found your channel. I've been looking for some educational resources. Thank you for the videos. I look forward to going through all this content. Okay. So my, uh, thank you for the kind words. First of all, Andrew Kaufman, uh, first off, um, a lot of the material so far has been kind of very, um, very technical because, uh, I first wanted to reach out to fellow graduate students and um, uh, college students or science students, but I really want, I do, I want to reach out to homeschoolers and in independent scholars. Uh, I have begun a chemistry lecture on one of my other channels, the Evidence and Reasons channel, Evidence Reasons Academy channel, where I give chemistry lectures and you'll just be, anyone can look at them and they'll be just totally bored to death, but uh, I'm, I'm actually going through like, uh, I'm, I'm planning to go through college chemistry, uh, an entire two semester co of college chemistry. Now, just to encourage you all that may think that's intimidating, there are a lot of basics you can learn without having to go through several semesters of college chemistry. There are enough of the essentials that one can learn. So, um, um, I'm happy to be of service to, kind of teach this and we will we, we will we do occasionally invite um, professors of biochemistry and molecular biology on the show uh, in fact they're always welcome to come here it's usually uh, whether they have time to uh, spend with us and I'm always grateful for it so um, thank you for the kind words and I'm hoping over the next year we can I can start to make the graphics a lot um, a lot better and the presentations probably not so clunky because uh, uh, most of my material has been kind of just slapped together and uh, I'd like to polish it up and, and, and make it a little bit more ready for prime time. So I'm going to look at through some of the other comments here and I, I did see some I wanted to share. Oh, someone was asking about the standing for truth. If someone could, uh, someone out there in the chat could actually help me, if they could find the link, uh, anyone who has um, mod privilege, if they could find the link to the standing for truth, uh, Rob Stadler, that's probably the best intelligent design uh, discussion I've ever seen. And it's not as technical as James Tour, which is helpful for people that are not familiar with chemistry. Dr. Tour's talk was definitely more oriented toward challenging people who are synthetic chemists and her origin of life researchers. He was reach, trying to reach out to the, to a general audience, but he, you could tell that he was just basically throwing down the gauntlet and saying, okay, everyone, including origin of life researchers like Lee Cronin and um, Jack Shostak and you name it, Demeter Kunev. It's like, yeah, he, uh, Dr. Tour laid down the gauntlet and is basically saying, okay, if there's something I said that's wrong, correct me on it. And um, uh, so there was some deep technical stuff there. Rob Stadler had, it was more, it was easier to, um, to, to digest, but he had a lot of material, a lot of material. He went into the stairway of life, which I will show here. See if I could grab a slide. I'm just going through my PowerPoint now. And I'm going to show, maybe to give some context of what um, Dr. Tour is talking about. Dr. F Tour's first six lectures so far, and then let me share my screen. Dr. Tour's first six lectures focused on um, the formation and concentration of building blocks, homochirality of building blocks, and a little bit on solution of the, uh, for the water paradox. So the stairway to life is 
again, the, the, the title of the book by Rob Stadler and Change Tan, and it talks about what they identified as major hurdles that have to be overcome. And there are actually many more than what you see here. And Dr. Tour has only really covered only the first two steps. That's only the first two steps. Uh, Dr. Tan and Dr. Stadler list even more, and they're just as brutal. The steps are just as brutal. So if you assume that, uh, just assume for the sake of argument that this step was, um, uh, was overcome, uh, the next step is going to be brutally difficult. And, and so um, at each of the steps, what they do in, uh, in the abiogenesis industry, th this fraudulent industry, what they do is they cheat. They just assume that this was fixed. And then w when they sort of not even get over that barrier, they suggest, well, we've done enough work to show that all of this will happen. Because that's what they'll often say, and it's annoying in their peer-reviewed papers. They'll say, oh, we did this. This suggests how life can arise. And it's like, no, they absolutely did not do that. And let me just verify. SFT is here. SFT, I, I recommended one of the videos on your channel with Rob Stadler. If you'd like to post a link to that, that would be, that would be fabulous. Uh, maybe someone already has. Oh, thank you. Th thank you, guys, if you have. So, um, if any of you, um, seems like we have a good crew here, uh, I'd be very uh, grateful if uh, someone would join the stream here so I don't have to do a monologue. It'll probably save my voice and it'll probably uh, be more helpful to the channel if, if we actually have a conversation. Because, uh, um, I mean, I, <laughs> I'd hate to go off topic and just start talking about other things. Uh, we could review a few things in, in James Tour's talk and I'd have to do it from memory. All right, okay. Let me look through my slides here. I mean, because I'm trying to keep this interesting because if I start talking about some of the work that I do, you would be bored to tears. <laughs> some of the work that I do professionally. Oh, before I forget, I have, oh, here's Tony. Thanks for joining, Tony. Hey, Sal. I missed hey, tonight's you, talk. If you wanted to review it, I missed tonight's tours uh, video. Oh, he was talking about the building blocks of the building blocks. Okay. And um, he, uh, Dr. Tur pointed out that, uh, quote unquote, Professor Dave said, it's so easy to synthesize DNA. We have machines to do it. I was to just do like, it, yeah. <laughs> that, that'd be <laughs> like one of the stupidest things I ever heard. Wow. It's like saying, it's so easy to fly to the moon because we've- We've uh, got rockets. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean- <laughs> Yep. I mean, how brainless a statement can you make? It's so easy to do this because we, we can make machines to do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, we can send probes to Mars. It has to be so easy to get to Mars. Yeah. Because we can build machines to do it. Idiocy. Well, they, put, they got that rover they just landed on Mars. I don't know how many millions they spent. <laughs> Redefined living, I'll tell you. He knows. He told me the other day. I don't know. So let me just, uh, and I, sh I shared this on my last, um, I, shared, I shared this briefly on my last show. Oh, by the way, I really want to thank you for talking about purified materials. Yeah. I, I didn't to... realize how, I really, I did not realize, it's only as I watched Professor Tour's talk. Oh, um was Professor it about the, when he was saying the kits, the synthetic kits, where they they get all that from the chemical companies? Yeah. I'd like to get more details on that and what actually they are. Well, let me see if I could. Um, uh, it, it, why don't you speak on uh, whatever's on your heart for the time being? And 
I was actually kind of moved by your uh, story of um, how you became a Christian, and it seemed to be tied a little bit to uh, just learning more about origins. Oh, yeah. Well, I was an atheist most of my life. I always, any chance I could get to bash Christians, I I pretty much took it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So what Mormons. changed your mind? Uh, pretty much the science, meeting a few people, some surgeons, some really brilliant doctors I met over the years, and they were Christian and just talks like this, you know, and then eventually James Tor and the whole SF team. Hey, standing for truth. You hear that? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, brother. Yeah, brother. Took, years, though. Took a long time. But, you know, our colleges, they're, they're all liberal. They're all atheist. I mean, it's all evolution. There's no God in the school system anymore. So. Well, I, I have to find a graphic for, uh, oh, Emery here, our uh, resident uh, graduate student in biology. I know you're real busy, brother. I thank you for dropping yeah, in I, here. I can stick around for a little bit, but I do have to eventually take off. I just spent several hours pounding my head against biostatistics, so I need to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Two billion. I'm, I'm so glad I didn't have to study that. I mean, not that I hate statistics, but... Um, I don't hate statistics, like, but the problem is it involves math, and I hate math. So <laughs> you can enjoy your math, Sal. I don't want it. Um, well, thank you for dropping in, and we may have more after shows. So uh, any any time that uh, uh, you can drop in, it's a great testimony. I think it's a great testimony. To, there may be people out there who are science students, and I tell you, I'm sure it's reassuring to them to know that there are other people um, who may be ID friendly, who are going through graduate school and who are going through college. It's just encouraging. So um, even if you could spend a few minutes, it's, I just think it's a great testimony. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I, I'm, you know, I actually had somebody uh, leave a comment on one of my videos telling me that they found me on one of these streams. So I'm getting something out of it too. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, great. Um, you know, what I'm having to do is uh, I'm realizing that I, I need to, there's, there's actually a great skill that logical, plausible, probable has. He knows how to make really good, some of these really snazzy graphics, uh, even yeah, logos he's and stuff. That. He's oh, he's so good, good at that. that. And so, uh, uh, John Maddox, if you, if you hear me, um, I want to connect with you and, and talk about how I can learn how to do some of that. And um, he can't join us in the stream right now because he's moving stuff. And um, I can't imagine the pressure of doing that. So hopefully, hopefully all the, uh, all, all the real estate has been settled and, and the dates and um, it's just a matter of moving, but then you'll be under pressure. Uh, you'll, <laughs> John will be under pressure to hit the deadlines to get stuff moved. So, um, because as we make the graphics, we can make stuff accessible to, to the layman. I really want to get a graphic here of showing, um, you know, I was showing the pictures of quarters, but, but what if I had other coins or other objects in there and you could just imagine putting glue and you just throw it together and they're, they're not going to arrange themselves in the way that we see in our light, you know, in, in the molecules of life. And, 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 and I think on many levels, the way that God had designed the chemicals of life is, is also signaling something. It's like you can take your best synthetic chemists on the planet. They're not going to be able to build anything near as extraordinary as the molecules of life. And, and, and we haven't even, Dr. Tour hasn't even gotten to the point in the lecture where he's talking about kind of the, um, uh, what we call the recipes and the uh, quote unquote information uh, that's uh, that resides in the DNA and how difficult it is to s synthesize that. I, I mean, there's just, there's stuff we're not even touching and it's already so difficult. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in my specialty in uh, 
protein and structural biology, trying to synthesize, trying to con even conceive of a, a multimeric protein, uh, it just boggles the mind. It just boggles the mind. So, oh, that's right. Impressive. I offered help with graphic. Check email, brother. Oh, thank you. Yes. Totally forgot. Oh, man, I'm, I'm getting so forgetful. I will, I will do that. I'll, I will do that. Impressive. Thank you. And um, because I, I want to, um, I actually want to start writing books, but I'll make the, I'll make the material available on video. And that's the way I advertise the book. Cause there's still some people that's like, even if it's on video, it feels, feels good to have a, have a book of some sort. And um, I'd like to do that. And it will also codify what I'm doing. Yeah. Man, it's just great having you guys. Just uh, yeah. um, feel free to speak what's on your mind. Yeah, Sal, if you if you need any help like with writing and whatnot, let me know because writing is something I do a lot better of than I do with talking. So like when I talk, I tend to open mouth, insert foot, but writing I tend to do a lot better. So if you need any help with that, let me know. Writing, reviewing, whatever, let me know. Oh, oh wow, great. I I'll take you up on that. I'll take you up on that. And I want to thank... I, I really may regret wanna... my life choices now, but... <laughs> Well, no, I'm happy to. Make, to. I'm happy to. Yeah. I'm just picking on yourself. Oh, and I'll need beta testers. So uh, I'm building a website that will evidence and reasons website. Mm -hmm. I'm building it out. It's right now under construction. So the YouTube channel has been kind of the flagship for now, but I'm actually going to be trying to do, I'm going to really be focusing on the website because it's easier to organize things. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so this is a good time to kind of do a little bit of promo. Um, the way that I, um, I have a private apologetics evidence and reasons group, and we have a certain mix of our topics. It, it's the mix that works for us, not necessarily for everyone else. But 15% um, of the evidences and reasons for the Christian faith are just Christian testimonies throughout history and in, in the present day. And there's some just marvelous testimonies of people that came to Christ and just all sorts of ways that the Lord touched them. And that's about 15%. That's usually the favorite topic. I'm gonna to be putting some of these testimonies up on the website. Um, actually, they're, it's basically gonna be a catalog because a lot of these are videos to other websites. But what we've done is our team has had 120 meetings in the, in a, in the last year or so, in the last 13 months, 120 meetings. And we've been curating and finding what we believe are good materials. We've actually, voted down some materials and say, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not fit for consumption. And so we've curate, curated it in terms of saying, okay, this is what we consider great stuff. So Christian testimonies. The next category, about 10% of what we do is uh, cover great topics in archeology, span how, how the more archeology span we study, the more uh, we get confirmation of events and places and people in the Bible. And that's also very encouraging. Now, 65% is creation, evolution, intelligent design. Uh, that's just the, that's just because of the people in our group. They're very interested in that. And then maybe 5% what we, we would call presuppositional apologetics, and 5% maybe difficulties in the Bible, like the problem of evil, um, the hidden God, et cetera, et cetera. So to give an idea of the presuppositional apologetics, uh, we're not heavy into it, but they're just some simple things we can ask. Like, okay, if one is a naturalist and that we're all bags of chemicals, there's there's a problem of how you affix value. How do you say something is good or bad? I mean, you when we're taught... Ex exactly, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, how do you say a chemical reaction is good or bad? It's going to be what it is. Mm -hmm. or, or like a, a rock, you know, uh, a, a rock uh, traveling through the air, it's just going to land. Is it good or bad? And by way of extension, if you are a pure naturalist, where do you derive your value system? And there have just been some stupid things that they've said, like Jerry Coyne. Oh, my goodness. He was saying it was so evil to be punishing criminals because um, it's not their fault. And I said, well... <laughs> You don't see the problem with that, Jerry Coyne. You're calling it evil. How, how, on what basis do you do you fix the value of good or evil at all? Yeah. 
So um, I, I hear you. Like, like I'm, I'm not like, okay. I, I do use presup, but I don't, I'm not it. Like, I'm not like massively into it all the way, but they have no answer for why they would ever call anything evil because they have, they, they have no foundation to say anything is evil. None whatsoever. Except unless they're stealing from the Bible. So. Exactly. They're co-opting. Oh, th thanks for the promoting my, my channel honesty. And I wanted to say, I really appreciate you guys. Um, I want to hit, I want to eventually grow out the channel and I'm figuring out how to do that. So like I said, presuppositional, but the creation evolution controversy figures into this. The problem with the creation evolution controversy is that um, it can get extremely technical and trying to get it more accessible is, is a big challenge. So um, I'm passionate about trying to uh, maybe build a curriculum uh, that can walk people through um, learning some of this. What's tragic is they don't, uh, a lot of churches just feel very uncomfortable talking about um, building your faith by actually studying facts. They a feel lot of really churches feel very uncomfortable about, t about really saying anything about anything controversial. Just, you know, let's just love Jesus and everything will be good. Sorry, that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> you can't. If that's the only, if that's the only thing being taught in in the church, we end up losing most of our young people because they don't know how to answer the the, the questions that they're being challenged with. Right. I mean, they feel even if you have people that are qualified in doing it professionally, even in my church, I'm not invited. I know. They'll say, "Oh, that's really great work you're doing," but no, you never get invited to Sunday school to teach it, even when you've offered. And then I hear parents coming back. Oh, I, you know, my kid doesn't know what to do when what he heard in public school. And, oh, they went off to college and now they're atheists. I'm just like, okay, what did the church what do, happened? you know, to help them with that? Nothing. That's so, what happened to me. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the church, the church has made a lot of mistakes in the last like 110, 120, 130 years. Um, but, um, that one is up there because like the church has just decided to stick its head in the sand, pretend that the cult, pretend that the colleges aren't going to turn, aren't atheist factories, pretend that the public schools aren't atheist factories. Like it was something like 90% of Christian, of Christians send their kids to public school. There's, there's an article on answers in Genesis on this, um, where, it talks about the percentage of time that, that kids in a public school spend in a school versus how much they spend in a church. And the, the, it's something like three or four to one. You can't, you can't compete with that unless the parents and the church are actively undoing everything that the public school is doing. And realistically, you're probably still going to lose anyway because the public it's just the odds. Then the odds are not in your favor. That's why I'm don't I'm not in favor of public education. But that's never here today. That's not my. That's not my. I'm not going to go into that on Sal's channel, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the point being, you, you're not going to win that just by, you know, having them go to church on Sunday morning and then going to, you know, maybe going to youth group on Wednesday night or whatever. That's a battle you're going to lose most of the time. And unfortunately that's where we end up with most of our young people is because we just, we, we show no discernment and no, we just don't think, we just don't think. Um, and, and no, this is, this is not a book, uh, Redefine Living. This is, uh, cause I've read already gone. That's a very good book. Um, no, this is, they actually did, this is an article where they actually went through and calculated up like how much time kids spend in a public school setting versus how much time they would spend in a church. If they're their best case scenario, um, like three to four times a week. And of course, most people don't go that often. So my, uh, my church accepts evolution, abiogenesis, big bang. They're pretty much deist. And they try to, they try to fit in a little bit of Christianity into that somewhere. So it's, it's pretty much lost. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Emery, could you, uh, or one of you, I, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to prepare a little bit of a uh, slide for some of the people in a little bit. Could you, could either of you share Romans 18 through 20? Sure, I can do me. Do you need me to screen share it or just read it? Uh, oh, screen share would even be better. Screen share. Okay, let me give me give me a second here, and I'll pull up something I can screen share with. The the read the point of this is, I'm trying to what I've tried to tell people, um, and some churches are really they don't want to talk about. Okay, what is it that will make someone believe? And if you look at the if you look at the New Testament, many times they appeal to God's works, not just believing for the sake of believing. And um, in the modern day, uh, some of us may or may not have access to, to direct miracles, but uh, those of us who have experienced it, uh, that's great. Um, but I've got a screen share coming, Sal. I don't know if you've seen okay. it. Okay. I see a screen share and it's blank so far. And as soon as I see something on it, I'll, I'll bring it. Why are you not seeing, you should be seeing like an entire, like the entire book chapter of Romans one. <laughs> I'm just getting a black screen. Okay. Let me, let me play with it a little bit and I'll see if I can okay. stop sharing and then restart the share. And, and see if what I'm going to do is since um, Andrew Kaufman came here and said, he's a layman. Uh, I'm going to try to just, uh, just do a quick introduction to elements of the periodic table and um, some molecular structure and how all this relates. And Sandy Pigeon, who is, uh, we know each other from church here in where we live, uh, he was asking a little tutorial on this. And really some of this is not that hard. It's just that sometimes people like me and others just get so used to talking in a certain language, uh, we just keep using the same terms uh, without defining it. And maybe I can remedy that a little bit. Uh, so I'll be back. Sal. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great, thanks. Are you getting screen share from me now, Sal? Uh, your screen share is up. All right. So you, can you see? Are you seeing the Book of Romans at the moment? Uh, I'm seeing Paul, an apostle of oh, yeah. Jesus. Okay. So, yep. So you do have it. Now you wanted 19 and 20, right? For, uh, Romans 1, 18 through 20. 18 through 20. Well, here it is. Um, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We understand things about God through the things that are made. And, um, I mean, we saw a little bit of that in James Tour's work. Synthetic chemists cannot make some of these molecules. Someone was really talented to make those molecules because they just don't happen naturally. And and I think you heard me say, I don't know if you heard me bashing uh, quote unquote, Professor Dave. Uh, he was saying, it's so easy to make this that we make machines. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, it's so easy to fly to the moon. Therefore we make machines. We can make machines to do it. And just like that had to be one of the dumbest things I ever heard. I couldn't believe you said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so let me share my screens here. I, I, I'm going to just try to show a few basics. We have the building blocks of matter here listed in the periodic table of elements. You'll see this in a lot of chemistry classes. Uh, and it lists the elements and they're, they're really, I mean, a lot of what you see in life is built only of six. 
it would be made of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, and sulfur. That, that'd cover like 90, 99% of what we're made of, just taking those three. And you're like, oh, that can't be all that difficult. But just like think about taking Scrabble letters and just throwing it. Think of all the ways you can combine it. And there's some things that just don't naturally combine um, and, and, and filter out. So I'm going to show a picture of, let me see, I have a picture of a water molecule. The structure of a water molecule, very simple. You just throw hydrogen and oxygen. Actually, in a rocket engine, you have liquid nitrogen, I mean liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, like in the second stage of the Saturn V rocket. And when it burns, it's just going to form a molecule, almost guaranteed the, the, uh, the products of the reaction will just have this simple structure. So I can understand the origin of life researchers said, oh, that can't be all that difficult. You just, you just have the right ingredients and it's going to spontaneously form. But that's not how it works once you throw carbon in. Once you throw carbon in, um, there's so many ways that the, uh, let me see, Let's see if I could find, I'm going to look for some pictures of sugars. Let me look for a picture of a sugar. Uh, so many ways that it can combine. Uh, I, it's, it's not quite so straightforward because as Dr. Tura was saying, you, you put all this you, you put all the raw ingredients, like say you, you just took hydrogen and carbon and oxygen and threw it in a soup. Uh, it's unlikely you'll be able to form molecules like that. It's that, you know, it's just, it, it seemed deceptively, it looked, uh, it looked deceptively easy, but it's very difficult to make it. God chose, God chose, he built materials that are going to be very difficult for synthetic chemists to build. It's enough to tell you, okay, someone a lot smarter than you put this together. Someone a lot smarter with a lot more capability. That's the message that I, that I feel is being sent to us in, in the thing of chemistry. So um, for Andrew Kaufman who joined, um, a lot of chemistry is just looking at diagrams like this. Okay, just, just let me fill you in. When I took biochemistry, the professor would make us memorize diagrams like this. He said, okay, you're going to recapitulate it on the, the exam. And thankfully, I didn't have to do carbohydrates because they're hard. Uh, I had easier molecules to, to, to uh, recapitulate. And so, yes, there's a lot of like, okay, uh, can you draw this molecule here? <laughs> and, and you would just have to have the H's and the C's and the O's in the right spot. A lot of chemistry is just that. The difficulty is being able to synthesize it and put the pieces in place because we don't have like the tools. See, it's nice when we can assemble a car, you have tools and you can connect stuff. You, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, our hands and arms and tools can connect things together. To do this at the atomic level is brutally hard um, depending on the chemical, depending on the chemical. Some chemicals spontaneously form and you get that structure. Uh, what all this thing about abiogenesis is about is that these aren't the sort of chemicals that spontaneously form. It's, it's not fundamentally, uh, I, I mean, it is on kind of a general level solving the origin of life, but the real problem is how did, how, how did the molecules of life, that's a more basic one because these are so hard to construct. Why is it that we need synthetic chemists to even try this and they're not even successful? So uh, that's at the low, that's at the kind of very primitive and just building block level of what Dr. Tour is talking about. At the higher levels, we start talking about like say the, the proteins that are molecular machines and then cells and then organs. Those, they're all levels of design. And what they're addressing here is just really basically uh, just even some of the primitive chemicals. So um, I think, yes. So, so 
if you just think about it there, you're only working with six basic elements. Six, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And you, uh, I can show it to you here a little bit, see if I have a picture of that nucleotide. Uh, see if I have a picture of it here. I, I have to just blast through my slides and then I could show it. All right, let me, let me share my screen here. I'm just trying to demystify some of this because you'll just hear so many terms and it can just be overwhelming. So what's this made of? Uh, you could see oxygen, phosphorus, and then implicitly in it, we call this a skeleton diagram where, uh, where every corner, unless otherwise noted, is a carbon. So there's a carbon here, a carbon here at this corner, a carbon here, carbon here at this corner, and they number the carbons like one, one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. I don't know why they have the prime. Uh, Dr. Carter would know. And then sometimes they'll put an O explicitly if, if it's going to be something other than carbon. And then here's a nitrogen. So every corner here is a carbon. Carbon here, carbon here, carbon here, carbon here. And uh, the, the line here indicates a bond. That's what we call a single bond and then a double bond. But that's almost, at, at a very primitive level, if you can get that, you that's a huge part of the way. The rest is just kind of learning the catalog. So just like in, um, just like that car an analogy, a lot of times you just have to learn the names of the parts. That's all, and just know their shape. So a, a mechanic would be able to look at parts and say, and give the name to it. I wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, I could identify a few things like say a spark plug, that's really obvious or a battery, but then there are other parts. It's just like, I, I wouldn't know offhand what that is. But a lot of chemistry is just a, a lot of biochemistry. Um, let me just correct myself. A lot of biochemistry is just reading diagrams and identifying, uh, giving it a name. And, and uh, again, uh, abiogenesis researchers have been pretending that these things can arise spontaneously and you can construct them very easily. It's, it's not true. It's for that reason we actually need machines to do DNA synthesis if we're going to try to do it from scratch. It's because it doesn't happen naturally. Would anyone like to join the stream? We have uh, four slots over and open. Otherwise, um, once Emery goes, I might have to shut down. Sandy Pigeon, would you like to join the stream? Uh, I'd be honored, sir, our resident Navy SEAL. I believe I have the link up in the- uh, If he joins, I have to find a way to, I have to find a way to salute him, so. <laughs> okay, S Sandy, you're welcome. We haven't had our, we haven't talked for a while, brother. I'm going to provide. The, I'm just going to put the link again in the in the. Uh, I'm going to do the invite. Okay, the link is. I'm posting the link in the chat, and you can click it and join. Dr. Pigeon, Lieutenant Commander Pigeon, uh, was a platoon leader in SEAL Team 8. He became a Christian not too long ago, and now he has a doctorate in apologetics. Welcome, sir. What's up, brother? What's up? How are you doing? Fine, thank you. How hey, can you... Yeah. Well, actually, I was, I was going to ask you a question about epigenetic information and the... Uh, the differences in, in how a, a let, let me back up. I was just looking out my window the other day and I had some tree limbs cut down. And out of the one dogwood tree, I just looked up and there are 30 branches, small branches growing out, you know, not out of the end where it was cut, but right out at the end of it. And I'm th I was thinking about epigenetic information and the ability of chromosomes then to express themselves 
uh, via that. Can you give us, uh, you know, a uh, <laughs> down and what dirty epi- on that? <laughs> oh, that- sure, sure, sure. Epigenetic information. So th- this isn't a gross. This is a gross approximation, but it's it's good enough. Every almost every cell in a human being has identical DNA. It's not exactly that. There are a few cells like mature erythrocytes, blood cells that don't have DNA. That That's, um, in general, every cell in the human is has essentially the same DNA. There's some variation that's important to mention. Mm-hmm. Um, but you could see that a uh, the cell for your eye, which is transparent, very transparent, you know, for the lens in your eye, it's very different than a bone cell. Epigenetic information is is kind of like, um, first off, that's a terrible term now, it's getting so abused, but let's say it's, it's kind of information that um, uh, differentiates one cell from another. It's tied to what they call development, development from the embryo to all these different kinds of cells. Well, can, only- can it be, and I don't mean to cut you off, but sure. I guess philosophically, can we, could we express it as latent potentiality in a cell that could explain microevolution in a better way? Um, I don't think so. I, 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 first off is we don't understand a lot of it. I, I point blank asked one of my professors um, and I'll show you, I could show a diagram of epigenetic information in a little bit. You, you could actually visualize some of it, not all of it. You can visualize some of it. Um, but uh, before we get there, I'm going to, um, I really like, I'd like, love to share your testimony here. And I'm just going to put it in the chat. So just let me type this because we, you're very kind to grant an interview. Hey, did Brad Henry get back with you? And I'm just providing a link. I'm sorry. Did Brad Henry get back with you, the pastor? Yes, yes he did, and I never got back to him. That's on me. Okay. That's on me. That that happened when Mom was really, really sick. Oh my goodness! Okay. I, 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 it's it's still you know kind of dicey. We're on on our end, but uh, she's at least stable because um, uh, a few Lord. weeks ago. Yeah. So I'd like to thank again all the viewers who are supporting expressing their their love and thoughts and prayers because uh, I was about to, you know, the doctor said she might have to go to the hospital. I'm just like, yeah, I know where the next stop will be. They'll send her right to hospice care, right back home. And in the COVID environment, you know, yeah. uh, hospital's a scary place to send someone because the doctors can do all sorts of things and y- you don't have any say. Uh, so anyway, I provided a link to Sandy's testimony for s- some of the people would like to just save it. But I'm going to show a picture of epigenetic. I think a picture is worth a thousand words. What, what, is, uh, I, I, while you're putting that up, Sal, so what would be the potentiality that we see in uh, microevolution that can expand uh, a, a, a kind to a different level and not, okay. by, not by human intervention, but by perhaps, say, environmental stresses? Okay, so there are, uh, I don't, I'm not really good at trying to f- define terms like um, microevolution, but there are, th- there are obvious things like um, when. Well, I hate that term because it's associated with evolution, but that, that, you know. Right, but at the very first level, at the very first level, the same set of parents can have very different looking kids and they are different on so many levels. Just because there's a mix of, of the genes from the mother and father and how they will kind of mix. So one kid will have traits that, they're, that the, their siblings don't have. I mean, even in terms of the DNA. So there's that. And uh, even though I don't like, God bless him, I, Nathaniel Jeans and terminology that he calls that speciation at some point, I'm just like, eh. Uh, I don't like that term either, but there, there can be there can be what we call phenotypic differences just based on the fact that there's shuffling of the different material available that's coming even from the same parents, and so there can be a lot of uh, specialization. Uh, so 
it's entirely possible, and I believe this is the case, that Adam and Eve had many of the alleles, what we call alleles. Uh, so you could have a gene and then little variations of the gene. The variation of the gene is called an allele. And all these alleles were there from the start. A few got added along the way uh, because of mutation, but there were a lot that were there from the start. And when the, when the uh, alleles get shuffled, we'll say the genes, but the proper term is alleles. When the alleles get shuffled, you can get all these different expressions. And we find that amazingly if you look at just even horse breeds how different the horses come and it's like oh my goodness they came from only one set of parents because we were able to you know the uh, horse breeders had very accurate records and you can't believe all the the varieties that came out um but it is really just the reshuffling what of the information that was there but now i'm going to share a well i guess what i'm trying to get at can you define the the latent potentiality that is within the genome that, again, could be latent and never expressed. And due to, just like my tree branch getting cut, those those branches would have never come out in, in, the, in the multitude that it has without my cutting that branch. Um, so can I take a shot at this? I was just about to volunteer you to do that. This is your specialty. <laughs> Yeah, th this is more my thing probably than Sal. Sal's more into the, the nitty gritty. This, okay, so there have been some um, proposals on this. I actually am. I actually did some writing on this on my uh, on my website. So th there's two proposals currently tossed around for like latent potentiality information in, cre in the creationist community. Um, I don't think either one of them is completely solid. Um, I don't think your trees are latent potentiality because what they're doing is they're responding to env an environmental stressor directly. So the genome is going, okay, we lost a limb here, but we still have the nutrition we need to make more leaves and branches. So we'll poke, we'll start poking them off from places that we wouldn't normally do it. So that, that I don't think is necessarily like a, anything um, outside of the ordinary, but I think like there, there's been two proposals, one of which was came from uh, Dr. Todd Charles Wood. He proposed an idea called um, mediated design. And basically what his argument was is, hey, after the flood, there was some stuff built into the genome. And I, he calls them, uh, oh, geez, what's he call them? AGEs, which I don't remember what that stands for. But basically what it means is that there's there was stuff built into the genome that didn't pop up until after the flood. Um, I, I don't, he hasn't really done a whole lot of work with it. So I, I'm hesitant to put a whole lot out there on it because like, I don't know, I don't know what he, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent him and he's only done like spoken about it as far as I know, he's only written about it in like one paper and like two or three lay level articles. So not a whole lot there. Um, and then there's Dr. Randy Galuza, who's the uh, president of ICR. He's tossed around an idea um, that he calls, oh goodness, I've, I, I've written about this. I even have it up. Um, oh, come on. Um, I'll, I'll give you a second. Let me pull the name up real quick. Ah, continuous environmental tracking. There we go. So basically his idea is that organisms generate variation from within in response to environmental stresses. Um, I think there's something to this on the level of um, outside the DNA information, but I don't think it goes as far as he wants it to go. Um, I, well, think I, think, I think you're capturing exactly what I'm trying to 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 okay. put into words, Emery, is is because I'm trying because I'm not a scientist. I, I kind of come from a, from a philosophical angle, um, but I think you've encapsulated what I'm trying to get my hands around is because I read an article in Evolutionary News about uh, there was two guys uh, that took the deductive approach on junk DNA and said, well, it's not junk. Uh, and they found out that it has some cancer killing properties, some other things, but it's latent. And their quest was to try to stimulate that latency, uh, you know, as a as a super conductor of, you know, white blood cell uh, reaction. So, so I'm trying to try to get something that the pedestrian like myself. OK. I can science. probably strip that one down for you a little bit. So basically what that's saying is that there's sections of the genome that we have that aren't always in use. And I, there I, you go. Yeah. We, exactly. we, we know this because like there's stuff that is used in the embryo and then never used again. Right. 
Okay. Um, yeah. so th like this is this has been known for a while, but the the extent of it is just sort of now coming out. Right. So, um, so what do you is there a a definition for that? I guess for lack of a better word. Um, there probably is, but my biostats fried brain right now isn't coming up with it. Um, <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Stats almost killed me in my doctoral work. <laughs> oh, they're, they're, they might kill me in my master's. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, but no, it, it's, um, I don't know what the term, I mean, I would imagine probably what a lot of people would call that would be epigenetics, but that would be incorrect because epigenetics is out, actually outside the genome, and this is actually in the genome. Um, I mean, I could call it latent potential information, but that would not explain to like 90% of people what I'm talking about. Right. Um, well, you're explaining it to me very well, brother. <laughs> All right, well, I, I, I'm but, the dumbest would, guy here, so, you know. Well, I, I would suspect you've got a Ph.D. in apologetics. I don't even have a master's yet, so let's not hear that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a D-admin, but it was all in uh, uh, apologetics. We did do some scientific apologetics, uh, creationism, and, and the, the arguments therein, and, you know, read Hugh Ross's right. books and went back right. and on OEC, YEC. But, but the, the – so I'm trying to get a definition for what exactly you have described so that I can give it to a, you know, a, an atheist that would ask questions about that and say, you know, the, the latent potentiality in the genome, um, you know, is just that, that there are things within there because that defeats – the mutation out of you know the 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 microevolution to macroevolution argument. Um, actually, there, uh, I wanted to say there there are better arguments against macroevolution. Um, well, that's just this that is just stronger, one of but, them. Yeah. But I wanted I wanted to show here's an example where <clears throat> just like we have different cells in our body that have all this basically the same DNA. You can actually have different forms of creatures here. And I believe these are referring to like an insect population, like say a bee or ant or anything where you have like a queen. They may have identical DNA, but they they are they are may they express themselves differently. That's what we call developmental plasticity. There's a lot of potentiality. I'll tell you something that's really striking is that humans you have male and female humans, they can be distinguished by their DNA. Uh, a male has the Y chromosome, the female doesn't. In turtles or other populations, the DNA between the male and the female is identical. The potentiality is made by differences in temperature. Temperature will make a male or a female. I mean, that's just fascinating to me. But you're getting right to the point, Sal. It's it's an as Emery did. It's an environmental stress which turns mm -hmm. on that latency. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yes, and um, there's such a mess of terms. I don't even go there. It's easier to just cite you know pictorial examples like this about saying, "Hey, all these all these forms have the same DNA, but you end up with a, you know basically almost a different creature and specialized roles." which is amazing. And so the environmental can actually, we call it developmental plasticity. So when you're talking about how your tree would just develop in different kinds of branches and all and the way how you pruned it, um, there is that potentiality there. And we don't really understand. Um, I mean, every creature implements it differently. I mean, the way the turtle ends up having male or female is just not the way the, the humans work. Well, so let me ask you a question because, you know, a lot of the tribesmen I worked with in Afghanistan could walk around in the snow, you know, either barefoot or wearing sandals. And one of the guys said that that's, that's, it's not an inherited thing. It's, it's a, a latency perhaps in training their feet to be in that cold weather. There's a guy out West who's a survival instructor, uh, Cody London, who does the same thing. He trained his feet to, to, operate in snow and, and across things that I wouldn't even bother walking across. But that gets to my point of potentiality and, and, and the potential for environmental stresses to then turn on that. I latent. think the word we want here is phenotypic plasticity. That might be what we're looking for because essentially what's going on is you've got 
the normal cold tolerance that you know normal people have and then you've got people who build up a resistance to whatever over time basically they their their phenotype that they have, that they have they've essentially it's become plastic because of the environmental stress well, it, it was plastic to begin with but it's changed due to the environmental stresses so i think am i right sal that phenotypic plasticity might be the word we're looking for here if i pulled out the right word finally i don't know i've never heard it that's not my specialty but okay. i mean even something as basic as lifting weights or uh cardio cardio training uh someone who who doesn't run a lot and then starts running a lot they're going to have changes in capacity of their system so uh, th there is a lot of latent stuff that can be environmentally influenced even in subtle ways but what dr sanford pointed out he, he said okay so you can lift weights and then now you're a little bit stronger but there's going to be a limit to how much change you can impose on yourself but see, that goes right to, that goes right to what you just said, Sal, goes right to my point is there is a limit to that. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm, I'm way out in left field here in my knowledge base. But the the plasticity or the, the ability to get, you know, as strong as you can, um, there is a limit to that in that latent potentiality is what I'm getting at. And Absolutely. so, and so that would limit one, a kind from 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 changing into another species because you can only go as far as that latency can go. In other words, you could have well, going back to your racehorse thing. You know, you can keep getting a racehorse to go faster and faster through through an intelligent designer breeding the, the, the or changing the breed and and mixing and matching, but within within the horse itself, it's never going to get past that potential that the genome would express. Is that, am I, am I? Right, and, and we're understanding why, unless there's a total rewiring of the genome, which isn't gonna happen. Right. And we actually find that, that these horse breeders tried to get, um, I think they call it the Kentucky Derby limit. They realized they couldn't keep breeding it and making the horses faster. They started to run up against the limit real fast Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, we might be able to improve a little bit, but it's just everyone can kind of already see it. You're not going to make there's certain limits just in terms of physics uh, and physiology and chemistry of how fast you can make the horse uh, run. And the same for how high the birds can fly. I mean, they're just um, they're limits. Now, we didn't quite understand that, but now we now that we know a little bit more about kind of physiology it's like oh my goodness you know unless you rewire this or that or give different plumbing and capabilities you're just not going to be able to do this or that um within a certain architecture and and the biophysicists have done a lot of good work in seeing um what we could you know um what actually can can be done and it, it's kind of subtle but that's the basic point there's going to be limits there there may be capacity for the species to be uh selectively bred and even in darwin's time it should have been obvious that they they, they began to hit limits and he was very it should have been obvious to darwin darwin bred <laughs> pigeons extensively yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and, so emory uh that phenotypic plasticity because i'm sitting here taking notes because this is really interesting to me um, because it again to the pedestrian without the kind of knowledge that you guys possess is a way to uh it's just another way to clear out a stumbling block and that's really my goal is you know as uh you know our job as apologists is to clear out all these stumbling blocks so we can evangelize mm -hmm. and so this may be just a piece for a person who has that stumbling block. And so would the phenotypic plasticity, am I, am I that far off in expressing that with, uh, you know, somebody who doesn't have a PhD in, you know, uh, in uh, genomic therapy, uh, genomic, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, in, in, in genome uh, studies or something like that. Genomics Is that, would work, genetics, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So is that is that because I'm going to look this up a little bit more and see if uh, actually Stephen Meyer talks about this. But yeah. uh, uh, actually, 
I think there, there's, I mean, this is just my personal, because this has kind of been my research area, that there are probably arguments that are, um, I, I think that are, uh, that can be visualized. And I'll, I'll provide you some graphics here if I can, let me see if I could, I have, I have one that I actually presented to a bunch of PhDs, but it, I had in mind the general public. If they could just, uh, because all these terms of plasticity and all, even that was kind of messing me up, but I'm gonna show you a, I mean, the nice thing is a lot of proteins are described with just ordinary um, English alphabet. Uh, but before I go there, I, I'd like to explain the, uh, the picture you, that I have here. We're talking epigenetics. Pictured here is the DNA in an embryo of a mouse right after fertilization. This is three hours after fertilization. On the top of panel A is the dad's DNA, the paternal DNA, and then on the bottom is the maternal DNA. You'll notice that, uh, and this is like eight hours, eight hours after fertilization and, and a few hours after that. You'll notice that the coloring here for the dad's DNA changed. It, it had all this illumination and then it got turned off. Those are chemical changes. Those are epigenetic modifications to the DNA. The DNA is actually having some of its chemical chemicals modified, what we call methylations. So these, these, the DNA is there, but then it's had pieces, other molecules added to it. And that's an example. That's a visual way of actually seeing an epigenetic change. That's one class of epigenetic change. We can actually visualize it. But the DNA is doing that, Sal? Is changing that color? DNA is having its color changed. Okay. And I asked the professor point blank. This is what I, where I was headed. I said, how does it know to do that? He said, no one knows. Interesting. No one knows uh, because, and Emery and I had a show on this, that there is information that's outside of the DNA. No one understands it, but it's able to do this. The mouse wouldn't, the mouse wouldn't be able to form from an embryo if it weren't doing these steps. And um, you could see here now the, now that embryo becomes four cells here and you could see the different coloring. And I, I have some even, even cooler uh, ones than that. But to your point in this, uh, I wanted to show a visualization. Let's see if I can bring this visualization up. This is the spelling of a, of a uh, protein. And it's just using English language alphabet. Uh, each of the English letters represents a different kind of amino acid. And there's a pattern here, and you could see it if I colorize it. You could see how those that C. Do you, do you kind of see what the pattern? There's a pattern there. It's non-random. Now, um, other proteins have different patterns. There's a common protein we call collagen. You can even buy it in the store. One version of it, anyway. And this is the spelling of the collagen protein. And there's a non-random pattern here. And where I was headed with that is, oh, this is the topisomerase protein, which I work on. Uh, you could take the zinc finger protein in a human and a pig, and it looks relatively similar and has the same structure, and you could build all these trees with it. And you could do the same with the collagen. But what you can't do is you can't have so this is an illustration of quote unquote what might what might look like microevolution in the protein between humans and other creatures, but what can't be done between the proteins is you can't have macroevolution from this protein to this one, it just doesn't work. And you, I actually confronted biologists. I said, how can you evolve this to this without breaking it along the way? I mean that really just forces it. It's not vague at all. And um, so I was working on visualizing the problem here. You could actually see the difficulty of macroevolution 
even if you assume universal common ancestry, it's like you'll need miracles along the way to make all these different kinds of proteins because they're so different. You can't, you can't take a single ancestral protein and evolve it to make all these others. So what you end up with is you have, um, it's like an orchard, all these independent origins. And I said, how, how is that very different from creationism? You just don't want to admit that they're miracles. And this is, I consider that a stronger, that's, uh, um, you can, someone can really sink their teeth in this and it's a very strong argument. The other one with the different kinds, I think intuitively, you could say it's very hard to, to imagine the ancestor of say a giraffe and a, um, a tulip. So I'll ask an evolutionist, describe a tulip. Describe the common ancestor of a tulip and a giraffe. Yeah, and doesn't, doesn't Aaron Ra go into some kind of eukaryotic uh, uh, ancestry, et cetera? <laughs> if he does, and Emory and I were deba would be debating and we'd be slaughtered. <laughs> I, 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 I have a lot of himself and it, and you can figure out what it is. I'm, I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, uh, no, sorry, that was a comment for Ra. He's absolutely full of both himself and it, and you can figure out what it is on your own. Yeah. I'm not putting that in there for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he uh, he's an interesting cat, isn't he? <laughs> you know, I, I thought I, I actually when I found out about his quote unquote phylogeny channel, oh, yeah, and for one one cow stampede, yes, phylogeny is pure garbage. You can make those phylogenetic trees tell you anything you, you want. want. <laughs> Absolutely anything. So I, when he when he came out with his silly phylogeny challenge, I looked at it and I thought about doing a video to respond. I'm like, he's just talking nonsense. None of this is worth anything. I'm not going to waste my time res putting the effort in to respond to this garbage. It's absolute garbage. So yeah, phy phylogenetics. Phylogenetics is a very interesting pursuit, and it might be useful-ish, sort of at the level of a created kind, maybe. But when you try to link multiple kinds, you're just, forget it, you're wasting your time. It, it, it's, it's garbage, it's just pure garbage. Oh, Sandy, I wanted to, um, you're asking a, a little bit about enzymes. Uh, if you wanted to, I, I could give you a little illustration of some of them. Yeah, sure, The uh, because my understanding, again, from my knuckle dragger level here uh, is that enzyme production is unique and that would be another piece that you could offer an atheist to stuck on evolution uh you know where do enzymes come from how do they link uh, you know I, I i get into tours i get into tours lectures but then my head starts to hurt <laughs> like when i had to read stephen uh stephen meyer's books um because it's just not my field. Um, I had to go back and read two or three times what he was saying. But uh, so, so, but I'm looking for that, uh, for lack of a better word, dumbed down uh, uh, factoid that you can offer to somebody on enzymes because I've been asked that before. Okay, there are a variety of enzymes and some, some are more fun than others. And let me just share this. Uh, Sandy and I uh, attended the same church and was pastored by Lon Solomon. Lon Solomon was an atheist up until age 16, and he's very bright. He oh, very man, he bright. was 22 before he uh, gave up the drug trade. <laughs> right. So he actually he became uh, a believer in some sort of deity at age 16, but he didn't become a Christian until six yeah. years later. And what made him pers persuaded him that there's a God is he was studying enzymes. And he's looking at this, he said, there's no way this could evolve. There's got to be a God. And he's just screaming it out loud there on the Virginia Tech campus uh, during that special summer program for high schoolers. And it was the study of enzymes. And I'm going to show a picture of a, one of my favorite enzymes here. And I, I'm hoping, I, I hope... I hope this it'll uh, we'll get the sound. Let me see if I can get the sound. I have to set this up so that we can get sound. Hang on, I remember now. I have to do a Chrome tab, and I could do this. 
And Emery, you know, thank you for uh, bearing with me on this. I'm just oh, trying to get the, you are welcome to the, well, the you, philosophical you know, pieces or, or getting this encapsulated into something that I can express to somebody who's got a stumbling block. So because because I do evidential apologetics, you know, more along the lines of uh, mm -hmm. biblical historicity, archaeology, etc. But this is one area that I really got to get a lot smarter in. Yeah, see, well, like, actually, if you got me into an archaeology discussion, I wouldn't know what I was talking about. So, well, let me see if I can. The problem is, I have so many tabs open now. Helicase. I'm going to have to, um, if you'll f excuse me here, I have to. I'm going to just kill some of my tabs here so I can actually organize this and sort it out from all the, I think this is what I want. Nope, that's not it. Let me kill this. I would make fun of you for having so many tabs open, Sal, but you wouldn't believe how many I have open. I only have one screen. So. Oh, <laughs> I think I found it. Here it is. I'll share the audio. Okay, this is an enzyme, and I'm going to explain it, but it's just good to just see how, just visually, how this machine works. Helicases separate nucleic acid duplexes into their component strands using energy from ATP hydrolysis. The crystal structure of this DNA helicase from bacteriophage T7 reveals a hexagonal arrangement of six identical subunits. Surprisingly, the ring is not six-fold symmetric, but is slightly squished. A model for the mechanism of how the enzyme might work explains this structural asymmetry. Of the six potential ATP binding sites, two opposing ones bind ATP tightly, two are more likely to bind ADP and phosphate, and two are empty. These three states may interconvert in a coordinate fashion as ATP is hydrolyzed, creating a ripple effect that continuously runs around the ring. Because of these conformational changes, the loops that extend into the center hole of the ring that are proposed to bind DNA oscillate up and down as seen in this cross section. The oscillating loops might pull a DNA strand through the central hole, thus unwinding the double helix in the process. A frontal view shows the full dynamics of this fascinating protein machine. The cases separate. Okay, I'll explain <clears throat> in detail for all the viewers. This is the DNA here. This you can see the double helix. And when we have to do things like replication, like when we're making cells and duplicating them, we have to duplicate the DNA. So the first part, the first part of doing that is taking the DNA and, and opening it up, Bra basically breaking the double the double helix and so we have these machines called helicases and you could see that it Wait, nucleic acid dupe. that it's moving like that but it's actually like a rotating motor it spins at like 20,000 rpm we can't make machines that work like that when we saw the chemistry of like the ATP there that's the fuel so this is like a jet engine and you could see the ATP is like the fuel that's going in there and just making it run and spin it's incredible and there's, there's something that uh, she said that was also interesting. Let's see if I can move it. Yeah, you can see it's spreading apart here. As this, I mean, this is happening super fast. We can't build machines like that. It actually has six copies uh, of the protein. Uh, so when it takes the gene, it has to make six copies. It has to make six copies of the protein from that gene. It takes the blueprint and makes six copies. And then it hooks the six copies together. And that's why you have the different colors. 
And then when they're hooked together, they end up being like that rotary engine. And I asked the biochemist, can you build that? <laughs> or do you know of any biochemist? If I said, okay, just build something that can do something like that, would you know how to do it? So is the Helia case itself then another product or another example of, uh, of Michael Behe uh, with uh, irreducible complexity? I would say yes. And I don't, you know, I don't use the word irreducible complexity because the evolutionists to figure out a way to, to be very clever. I just say, look at this. Can you tell me how that evolved? What's their argument that they're using against irreducible complexity? Because I haven't found any. Uh... Oh, there was one that was very clever by Dr. Cardinal. He, he said he found a irreducible complex system in a virus and then it evolved. And it's like, oh, OK, that's kind of like, uh, you know, a lot of us are not very knowledgeable in that area. We can't confirm that it was irreducibly complex. So I just say unevolvable complexity. Well, if it, it well, that kind of, it, it's kind of a self-refuting statement because if it devolves, it had to be made in the first place. Yeah. So, so what makes it? So it's still irreducibly complex. Well, I, you know, I don't get into the argument of whether it's irreducible complex or not. The fundamental problem is, can this arise by random mutation and natural selection? And, yeah. Uh, in this case, this, uh, whenever, oh, by the way, whenever you hear uh, a chemical that ends in the ASE, like helicase, tropoisomerase, ATP synthase, the ASE suffix usually indicates it's an enzyme. There, there are other kinds of proteins, but this one I showed because it's just spectacular. It's, it is an enzyme. Uh, its role is to modify the DNA double strand and make separate it into single strands. It's just, it's just bewildering. I mean, that's why I like this one. It's, it's visually compelling. And there's another one called ATP synthase. Have you ever seen the ATP synthase? Um, <laughs> the ATP synthase looks like a generator. Let me see if I could dig up a picture of ATP synthase. Uh, ATP. Someone won the Nobel Prize on this, by the way. Let's see if I could show a video of it. Um, uh, this is Sigma Aldrich. Is this a video? I'll just take a risk. I don't know if it's going to render on this computer. Okay, animation. I've never seen this animation before, so I'm taking a big risk, but I'll, I think I'm going to try to show it anyway. And this is another enzyme. I mean, not all enzymes are this spectacular, but I, I want to show some that are real, that are, uh, uh, that are fun. So. So this is an ATP synthase, and What is that being expelled out of that tube? Okay, so the H plus are protons. They're hydrogen ions. Okay. I, I can't see it on the... And you can see the, the, the little H pluses. Yeah, okay. And then it's uh, in the process, it's creating these a, uh, ATP. But the, the thing to get is to see that this is like a rotary motor. Yeah, yeah. And they're actually... they're. They're like 20 some parts that have to fit together perfectly for this thing to work. And we'd be dead. 
um, when someone gets carbon monoxide poisoning, it shuts down this system and kills them. And we might, I mean, there might be a life that might be able to survive without a, this kind of enzyme, but it's just like really unlikely. But in any case, that machine is so precise. So in Lon's time, they didn't have anything as well visualized and characterized as this. So uh, uh, if the young Lon Solomon were around today, he'd be even more wowed because yeah. I like showing, the reason I don't like uh, just talking about enzymes, if you actually see the picture, it makes you think, how can that now, is, is Is ATP synthase, uh, is, is it a specific type uh, of enzyme or is that common throughout the entire human body? Oh, it's it's abundant in the human body, and it's abundant in I think almost I don't I know of no living creature that doesn't have it have one form of it, and it's actually made of uh, like a lot of enzymes. It's a complex of several different kinds of proteins. It's not one single protein. So a lot of these enzymes, a lot of the evolutionists will cite an enzyme that's just made of one protein, which even though it's amazing, it's relatively trivial. Uh, compared to something like this that has multiple parts, like 22 parts. And and uh, it's like, okay, if you want to say just the difficulty of evolving an enzyme, show, show them like something like this. And the point of this is that what good are the individual parts? This is like having a car without spark plugs. I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah. You, you can identify certain critical parts. If you don't have them, it just is, it's, it's just, just not going to work. It's like having, I mean, Anyone that works with something mechanical, like say a rifle, you can identify critical parts if it's not there. It's not. It's just not going to work. And and uh, same with motors or anything mechanical. And um, uh, the ATP synthase, that sh the Discovery Institute, like showing it off, because uh, at every level that we study it, it's like, yeah, this is really hard to believe how this evolved. I mean, they'll come up with some measly explanation like they always do that aren't really legitimate just so they could pretend that they've solved the problem and they, they never did just like these abiogenesis papers that dr tour is cr criticizing he's saying they're just pretending that they solved the problem they never did and it's not honest yeah that's so, I, that, that's an excellent example right there atp synthase is is to, in my mind in a pedestrian sense that's that's irreducibly complex right there. Uh, yeah. You know, like the bacterial flagellum or, or uh, uh, blood clotting, et cetera, you know, those kinds of things that, that there's no way they could have uh, uh, evolved. It's just impossible. So, so that's why, I, I, like, I get away from just theoretical discussions. I say just, I prefer, I'll just show you a couple pictures, you, you know, and it, a picture tells a thousand words. So, so yeah, absolutely. To... I think, in, in, you know, you're, you, the, in, and I told you about that, the, the kind of comic, funny comic you did, but, but actually the visualization of that was really, really good. And uh, I have used, especially when I'm teaching foreigners, not, you know, outside of Christian apologetics, but when I was teaching them, those kinds of things for survival or, you know, depending on what, what the topic was, we always had to have, uh, something that was visual um, because things were always lost in the translation but once you get something visual and a lot of people are visual learners I'm a visual learner so it, it, it's very very valuable I know it takes a lot of your time but man it's it's worth it uh, I'll tell you so we can get graphics like this see this is so much more I mean personally I think showing just this is way more effective than trying to say it's so difficult to evolve an enzyme absolutely anyone with mechanical acuity Will be like yeah that's really hard that's yeah, absolutely and, and and most especially males have that kind of <laughs> mechanical i mean let's face it i mean it's you know you know i'll be sexist what the heck you know but 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 but, but even uh i know a lot of, of women that i did i talked to when you show them the graphic they understand it immediately and we do that for communications in, in showing when we're yeah. doing a communications plan you know, it goes from a microwave to a satellite down to, uh, you know, a, a server to this, to that, so that you can show disruptive patterns in 
tech, you know, if you're trying to take out a relay station, for instance, what's the critical node? What's the center of gravity? And a center of gravity would be akin, you know, if you're doing an attack plan, would be similar to that. Yeah, and, and there are multiple parts. As you said, carbon monoxide would take that out in, in a second. So, yeah. So, um, where was I headed with this? Oh, I was saying this whole thing about synthetic chemistry. One would need synthetic chemistry just from the bottom up just to make even the parts, but then you need another level of biochemistry to actually start to spell all the proteins here. And once I, I do have a slide where I actually spelled out what the proteins look like. And I, I'm just like, I'm just like, there is no chemist or engineer on the planet that if he didn't know how this worked and you just said make a motor that does this they wouldn't know where to begin it's too difficult there's technology there that exceeds everything we have and it's like god is saying hey i left you i left you i left you an archaeological artifact that's telling you that there's someone in the universe that's way smarter than anyone on this planet way smarter than anyone on this planet and every any scientist that'll ever live by the way yeah well, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Emery, sorry to, to hold you up there, brother. I know you wanted to get into some. Oh, something you're fine. Little. You are perfectly fine. So, But I do probably need to take off and get some work done tonight. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because we you might have another. In? Biology. Awesome. Where? I'm not going to reveal that because I operate under a pseudonym. And if I were known my where I was going and what my real name was, I would lose my position. So. Okay, well, I didn't want to press you. No, no I, I get it. I, I totally understand. It's a natural question to ask. I'm completely overt here. <laughs> yeah, the, the, <laughs> it's a natural question to ask. I totally get it. It's just I am, until I have that piece of paper that says I've got my degree, I can't, I can't afford to take risks. So, <laughs> so. I'm, Sal, about I'm talking about. So you can ask Sal about that. <laughs> Well, so, you take care, Emery. Anyways, have a, yeah. have a wonderful night, guys. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Appreciate it. God bless. Bye-bye. Glad we finally had to talk. Uh, it's been about a month or so, and we've been talking about apologetics and reaching out. And I know you see me get into some really technical stuff, but I, I hope that just showing you the five minutes of the ATP synthase or the helicase. Yeah, it's perfect. I, I, yeah. I'm telling you that visualization is very, very effective, you know, as far as a, a from a teaching perspective goes very effective yeah and, and and the thing that i can tell you is if they try if if an, <laughs> some evolutionists have said they figured this out i just laughed i said you guys don't know what you're talking about um i can say that if i put this the helicase or this on the table i could say i, I could tell you we could have a pretty good discussion um and you're you know you could throw all the papers at us that you want and i will show why your supposed papers and explanations aren't real explanations. They're not mechanical explanations. And, and I, you know, and then I could even throw one that's uh, in my specialty of topoisomerase, because the problem is if it's half built, you're dead. If it's half built, you're dead. You don't get another chance to evolve. You're dead. Yeah. If it doesn't even exist, you're probably dead. So, um, you know, you know, if they, if they want to have that discussion, we're game, but uh, a lot of them won't show up. They'd rather talk about feathered dinosaurs and stuff and change the conversation, talk about, you know, oh, gee, the chimpanzee looks so similar to humans. They don't want to talk about stuff like this. And that's exactly when I hear, when I see the stuff that they don't want to talk about, that's what the creationists should, should talk about. What ends up happening is the creationists will just try to refute, <clears throat> will try to let will let the evolutionists define the battleground. I'm just like, you don't do that. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're, you we're always you... on defense rather than offense, and that's right. the problem. And and it, I was watching Tor's video, and it's amazing the, the deceptive nature of the language that they use to explain all of their uh, findings. It, it, it's a very deceptive language. You know, if you had a lawyer in there picking that apart, they'd – that that paper wouldn't pa pass muster yeah yeah so um so i i, I think uh you know uh, i've been trying to get the creation i said stop letting them choose the ground of battle yeah. you're letting them pick the topic that's favorable to them 
what you should do is pick a topic much more favorable to you and uh, try to get them to argue it. And they'll, they fold real quick. They'll try to change the topic. I, I know that. And um, um, so I'm trying to get them to stop doing that. I said, you're, you're going to keep, it, it, it's just like going to the fight deliberately going in, in the place you're not going to, you're going to have a hard time winning. You're not going to be able to use your best weapons. So um, I'm glad things are changing. The Discovery Institute has been very, um, very good about he helping identify things that we should talk about. And, and uh, the ATP synthase is one of them. Absolutely. So, yeah. They're, they're on offense, which is good. So, um, I don't know if Dr. Uh, if someone in the chat could look this up. When's Dr. Tour's next talk? Because um, otherwise, if he's going to have another one soon, we'll just uh, we could close this uh, talk and uh, just wait for tomorrow's after show, and we could talk some more. Uh, so, and actually, I'm running out of gas. If, is there anything on your heart you'd like to share before I? Say goodbye. No, to uh, I left McLean uh, through in my resignation, but uh, so we're going to Cornerstone now, and I'm uh, trying to. Uh, I'm starting talks with them about doing some apologetic conferences. I think I already talked to you about that, but uh, okay. So you're out in the open that you you've resigned. And, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm presume Mrs. Pitchin's happy because now you. Oh can yeah, yeah. Now we're going to church together, so she's pretty happy. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I just. Uh, it was very, very unfortunate that that the the rhetoric coming out of there is still, you know, towards CRT and all the rest of that nonsense. Um, but uh, Gary Hamrick is really, really good, and and he's very much like Lon. Uh, a lot of uh, historicity of the Bible, a lot of apologetics in his sermons, uh, and not so much scientific, but but I think that's something that he would be amenable to to us, you know, helping to insert into his, uh, his programs, uh, maybe not his sermons, but his programs. And a uh, girl who was the events director for McLean is at, is at uh, Cornerstone right now. So she will be very helpful in us trying to establish something there. So I'm looking Wow. I wanted to point out, I got a letter recently that Reston Bible Church also has been very critical of what's been going on at NBC. Yeah, Reston's a pretty mm -hmm. good, that's a pretty good church. Uh, so Emmanuel is, as well. He, in the Emmanuel Bible Church, the guy's a retired uh, either F4 or F14 pilot. Uh, the oh, yeah. Tom, Tom Joyce. Uh, so I, I am betting that we reached out to him at some point that he might be amenable to to some kind of a, a conference therein. And a couple of guys, the guy who's the security director at NBC is he's there with his wife, who is a uh, PhD in nursing, by the way. I, wow. I, I set them up on a date. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he owes me he owes me a favor. But oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so well, you but, know, um, just for the viewers here that are wondering what Sandy and I are talking about, we live in the same geographical area in the Washington DC area. And there's been an interest. Uh, th this is a very high tech area, particularly in biotech. We live near the biotech corridor. Uh, the NIH is here. Uh, a lot of biotech companies are here. Johns Hopkins University is here, Georgetown University, George Washington, all these medical centers. Uh, so this is a biotech heavy place and uh, this is also ripe for teaching the wonders of God in this area. There are also a lot of great churches here. Even though D.C. has a lot of evil stuff going on, uh, God has also raised up great men of God in this area. And uh, so Sandy and I are talking about how to reach out at least first to, so we could meet each other and support each other. And then next, probably on the priority, is just support people in the church, especially yeah, the youth, because they uh, – they're not being fed. They're not being equipped to be able to go to colleges and kind of deal with the stuff that's just going to be rammed down their throat yeah. for four years. And um, uh, and then the churches are complaining, oh, what happened? Why are we losing the next generation? Let's have a new evangelistic plan. I'm just like, guys, why don't you just start with your own family first? Because <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and it's uh, unfortunate that uh, a lot of the churches are then uh, bowing to culture uh, to try to fill pews rather than teaching the word of God. So it's it's very unfortunate, and especially in this area. Scientism, as you know, has become a religion unto itself, and uh, it's rampant. And that's what my whole dissertation was on, on, mm -hmm. on trying to, you know, affect that back into the, the cultural uh, corner or cor cultural square, if you will. The, the one area, surprisingly, I, I mean, it's not obviously universal, but there's been a spark. It's been in medical researchers, like at the NIH, one gets the sense that there are a lot of quiet um, sympathizers of ID, partly because one, they're dealing with a factor of death every day, being in the medical profession. And a lot of doctors have Christian leanings um, because, you know, they, they're, they're faced with the fact of death and human suffering, and it changes your outlook. You begin to say, okay, what really matters in human existence when you're faced with this? The second thing is they're seeing the complexity of life. And there's a higher proportion of doctors that are sympathetic to intelligent design than other disciplines. The people that are actually medical doctors or medical researchers, um, I've been I've been hearing that because I wander the I, I associate with some of the people at the NIH and they said, Oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, they just don't want to talk about it, but a lot of them are in the closet. They don't want to jeopardize their career. And there have been some actually that wanted to be more vocal. And I've actually said, no, don't do that. It's not, wait till you're about ready to retire. We need you too bad right now. We need you to keep doing like what James Tour did. You know, he wasn't vocal most of his career, but now he's established reputation. He can say what he needs, what he really is on his heart, and he'll have a lot of authority. And so we've actually encouraged some people that are eager to talk, and God bless them, they want to share the gospel. I said, you know, it's just too dangerous right now. You'll have your day. You'll have your day. Well, that day's about here, brother, if we don't start preaching it because things are going south very – and I, I don't mean south – well, I, I guess I do mean south in a pejorative sense, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, things are getting bad. Uh, I just got to you'll, – you'll love this. Uh, I, I was asked to volunteer to take the vaccine, and I said, no thanks. <laughs> I don't need it. I got zinc and D3 and hydroxychloroquine. I don't need that stuff, so. Well, uh, let me just share this. Uh, um, I've taken a thousand vaccinations because I have allergies for thir over 30 years. I was going in for shots every two weeks or uh, two shots a month or sometimes four shots a month. I've had flu vaccines, all sorts, uh, given it to the family. I'm, I feel modestly comfortable taking a vaccine that has been tested for like 10, 20 years. This stuff that is rushed and it's just political. Yeah. I can't trust the reporting if they're saying it's killing elderly people yeah. or not. Because I, one country says it is. One, I said, you haven't done enough testing. So I'm just saying this is someone that has had a lot of vaccinations. I don't feel comfortable. Some people were saying, get your mom to get this. I said, it could kill her. Yeah, there is there is a uh, PhD in, in the UK. I'll send you after, afterwards. I'll send you his uh, his. Uh, findings on aluminum and thimerosal uh, in vaccines. Wow. It's very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, whereas the CDC and one, and you go to the CDC factoid, frequently asked questions, it says, is thimerosal, uh, you know, harmful to kids? And then three paragraphs down, it says thimerosal has been, re been removed from all, uh, uh, you know, pediatric uh, vaccines. Okay, so which is it, you know, and the incidence of autism, you know, from that. And I was having this discussion with Leo Phileas the other night, and he's because he just calls everybody an anti-vaxxer. And I said, Leo, there's different vaccines and there are different additives to them. So I'm not against, I, I've had anthrax, yellow fever. I mean, you, you name it to go down the list because you have to have all those things to even get into some countries in Africa or where I worked. But not all vaccines are the same, and, exactly, and exactly. you know he doesn't he doesn't differentiate between that. He just goes on this rant of anti-vax, you know. So it's terrible. And I'll say this: the thing that was very sobering, because I have family that are in the medical profession. Two of them got the vaccine. Both of them got sick. One of them very bad, very seriously sick. Not seriously, but was out for two days. 
said, if that happened to my mom, she'd probably be dead. I don't think she, her, her, she's so on the, you know, her condition's so frail, it'd probably kill her. I yeah. said, no, you don't just give this stuff out indiscriminately and we don't have a lot of data. I mean, okay, you could just say, okay, these are the people that have all these medical conditions. You need to gather data on the effect of this to, to build confidence. And I don't have the, I don't have the confidence that the reporting is going to be accurate. And yeah, and, been, and the yeah. thing is, the Journal of American Medical Association just walked back all their comments from earlier this year that hydroxychloroquine wasn't to be trusted, where the CDC in 2006, mm -hmm. Fauci himself put out that hydroxychloroquine was going to be the remedy, you know, and why is it being, in Vectorin is being used uh, in India very effectively, they're handing that out, you know, hydroxychloroquine, which is just you know, it's Plaquenil, it's, it's in base elements of every uh, malaria prophylaxis that I've ever taken, you know, depending on where you are, what region in Africa you know, has not had a breakthrough. So why are they walking all this back now? I mean, it's all yeah. political, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, I, I had family take this. One of them, she's a medical su surgical support staff. She got, she got sick in the, in the second vaccine. And it was, you know, that's, that was serious enough. I said, yeah, someone, uh, someone with very frail health probably wouldn't survive that level of sickness. And, um, so anyway, uh, I think George Bond said that, uh, James tour may speak in two days and maybe I'm going to try to, it'll be maybe throughout the year. I'm going to try to improve my slides and my presentation so that it's a little bit clearer. Uh, I'm just using old presentations and it's kind of fragmented, but uh, um, I'd, I'd like to be able to explain what he's saying. It's really basically the same thing over um, j just little variations on a theme, being able to get purified, getting the right components in the right place. It's not so easy, not so easy. And, and the, the big takeaway is this may not have been evident for most of Christendom, but in the 21st century, we could say, what God has put in the cell is far beyond human capability. So when Jesus said, consider the lilies of the valley, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. That has a very different meaning in the 21st century. Amen, brother. Amen. The Lord knew. The Lord knew. That was, that was, that was prophetic. Yeah. Especially now. And, uh, when we see all the trouble, you know, Jesus said not to be anxious. And he said, look at, look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. And so I studied the cell and I'm comforted. I said, there's a God here. Um, uh, let me set something straight. Creation myths said, Sal, don't tell me you're an anti-vaxxer. I, I don't know if you heard it. I said, I've had a thousand vaccines in my life, yeah. a thousand yeah. because I have allergies. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I am very concerned that, uh, two of my relatives who are in the medical profession had gotten the vaccines and they got ill. So, uh, I mean, really ill. I mean, I've had all sorts of vaccines in my life. I've never had reactions like that. And there may be ways that they can adjust this. It's just, just been rushed so fast, you know, like when I had my vaccines, they gave me little bits at amount cause they knew I couldn't tolerate it. Yeah. It could be as small an adjustment as that. So, no, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Someone yeah. who's had a 1,000 vaccines is not an anti-vaxxer. Yeah, same here. And, and I'm looking at the creation myths. We're not anti-vaxxers. All, all vaccines are not created equal. <laughs> yeah. just, the outcomes yeah. are different. <laughs> but, but in my, yeah, see, like, I mean, I just want to set the record straight again that my uh, this relative who got sick, she's in the medical surgical support. She, she's relatively young. We've been debating whether to give the vaccine to my 94-year-old mother. Uh, she can't probably even take a common cold and survive. So th this decision is really big because if, if she gets an adverse reaction, uh, that could be her end. Um, so uh, this this really is serious for, for decision for us. Um, the only reaction she, she's had one bad vaccine. That we think it there was contaminated. This was in the third world country for tetanus. But other than that, she's been getting vaccines all her life. But the vaccine for uh, shingles, she had a really bad reaction to that. 
uh, that set are behind pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just like, yeah, you know, the last round, you know, maybe your body just can't tolerate too much adversity right now. So that's the decision. So just to set the record straight, I am not an anti-vaxxer. I am, I would like to just get more data and just get honest answers, which I, I don't feel we're getting. Yeah. Amen. It's, it, it, there's a lot more to this uh, discussion. That's for sure. And, uh, I'm looking down, I'm kind of laughing here. Tony Maurice is down. What do you say? Uh, Rachel Levin, who is now the, what is she, deputy, or he is deputy secretary, kind of looks like uh, Garth on Wayne's World. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but but keep up with those visuals, Sal. Those are really, really good. And I think if you, especially with your teaching application to this, if you take it from the, the you know, the simplest thing and then see the complexity grow, um, per God's plan, that's really going to hit home. Uh, and I liked as as you did with that other video, you know, which was also entertaining with the the cow pies in there. So oh, thanks, <laughs> yeah. thanks. Yeah, so. we'll we'll uh, God willing, we'll figure something out to to do in this area. And yeah. uh, I, I'm staying at McLean because I don't have you know under the lockdown, I can't find another church right now. And um, I actually do. I had a special granted special privileges uh, that I could be in two congregations. Yeah. Uh, and I may just keep it just for the fact that I can kind of do a rear guard action. And uh, well, and I'm hoping that things change, you know, and, and, uh, but I'm not, I'm not that hopeful after what some of the elders told me. So uh, anyway, but that's neither here nor there. Um, you know, the expansion of what we want to do though is, is, is looking very bright. So I'm real hopeful. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, it's not the first time in church history that the leaders um, and the churches have, have had problems. And yeah. so I, I'm really not, I'm not even focusing on changing the church leadership's mind, but like I said, even recently, um, some of the teenagers have been, searching us searching for answers and it's just great that I, we happen to be there and that's all i could do right now no coincidences brother yeah yeah brother all right so i'm gonna uh shut the stream down sandy man it's been great seeing you again this is like the first time we've talked since uh yeah. you gave your testimony good to hear, and seals good to hear for your jesus. voice brother yeah yes so Absolutely. um to the viewers check out seals for jesus on this channel uh that sandy pigeon story as uh he was this naval seal before um um becoming uh what he is now he is a uh, he has his doctorate in christian apologetics and um i'll see you all at the james Turr's talk again i may have another show uh, a technical show in between then so take care all of you and god bless you god bless you brother